thank you so much, uh, Professor Apolog, the Technion, Professor Moshe, and all of you here. Uh, thanks for the kind honor. I think of it as an honor for the field more than for me, but thank you anyway. And I'm going to tell you a few words about string theory. Einstein is most famous for having invented relativity theory. And relativity theory is, first of all, special relativity that governs what happens when bodies move close to the speed of light. But the deepest part of relativity theory is general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity, where he describes what happens when there are very strong masses producing large curvature of space and time, black holes in the extreme case. And after having discovered equations of gravity that were quite similar to Maxwell's equations of electricity, Einstein had the bold vision of going farther and unifying the forces of nature, finding a common framework for all of the physical laws, which he hoped would have the beauty of his general relativity and would give our understanding of all of physics, at least in principle, at the most fundamental level, the beauty of general relativity. Now, Einstein didn't succeed in this quest. He left us with lots of inspiration, but not a lot of very concrete ideas about how to proceed. Now, there are lots of reasons to think that Einstein's goal might be too ambitious or might have been too ambitious. For one thing, we might be missing crucial clues. In fact, looking back, almost all physicists believe that it was hopeless for Einstein to face this problem because too, many of the most, too much of what we now regard as the most important clues were simply unknown in Einstein's day, such as the weak interactions of nuclear beta decay, the strong interactions that hold the nucleus together, the world of elementary particles, and the role of what we, of what we call gauge theory in describing all of that. So from a contemporary point of view, Einstein's quest was probably hopeless because of all the clues he was missing, and of course, the same might be true today. And even if we could find the unified field theory that Einstein was looking for, we might not be able to decide if it's right. Some of nature's big secrets might be lost at what physicists call the Planck scale. If you take the most fundamental constants of nature that we know, Newton's constant of gravity, the Planck constant of quantum mechanics, and the speed of light, you can combine them together into a scale of lengths or energies where the length is so small and the energy so large that there are very few conceivable experiments that give us only rather limited information about what happens at such scales. So if some of nature's most important secrets are at that scale, which is a very open possibility, it might happen that even if we could find the unified field theory, we might not be able to decide if it was right. Now, it doesn't sound too promising to work on, and no one who worked on it on purpose has gotten anywhere in the half century since Einstein. Probably it wouldn't have been uh, useful, to, except that roughly 30 years ago, physicists stumbled upon something called string theory, which looks like it does shed light on this problem. In string theory, roughly speaking, instead of being a little dot, an elementary particle is a loop of vibrating string. Of course, I'm hiding a lot, when I speak of a dot, I mean a point particle that obeys the laws of relativistic quantum mechanics, and you have to take a whole course about what that means in quantum field theory. But in string theory, instead of being the quantum version of a dot, it's a loop of string, and like those beautiful harp strings and so on that we heard about before, where the richness of the music comes from the many shapes in which one of these strings over here can vibrate, likewise, one of these strings can vibrate in many different ways, giving us the different elementary particles. So string theory actually was discovered and proposed in the early 70s as a theory of the nuclear force, the strong interactions. And it actually failed in that guise. Although the failure was interesting and has continued to arouse interest ever since, and reconsidering that failure will really be the topic of my lecture on Thursday which is the only one of the three lectures I'm giving that's really intended for non-specialists. After failing in the early 70s as a theory of strong interactions, string theory was revived in the early 80s by some of my colleagues as an approach to an even more ambitious problem, which was to describe all the forces. The basic idea was that all particles and force carriers of nature arise as different states of vibration of one basic string. Okay, first of all, if we go back to the harp, str harp string, why does the harp music sound so beautiful? And instead, if you play the same note on a tuning fork, it sounds extremely harsh. 
A tuning fork will produce a basic frequency, which by itself sounds extremely ugly to the human ear. The harp string produces a melodious combination of the basic frequency and what physicists call the higher overtones, multiples of the basic frequency. And those combinations of different tones are what makes music sound beautiful. Here, the idea is that the different particles and forces come from different ways that one string can vibrate. Now, by the early 80s, there were fairly convincing models of the quantum version of Einstein's general rel relativity, not his classical theory, but his quantum version, unified with matter. But there was a flaw. Many things looked like they could conceivably be right, but there was one important observation about nature, probably one of the most important observations in the world of particle physics, that was wrong. In nature, we see that the basic laws Okay. Roughly speaking, if you look at a physical event and you look at the same event in a mirror, in the mirror you see a possibly different event, but a possible event. However, at the microscopic level, we find that there's a basic asymmetry of nature between left and right. The weak interactions have definite handedness. The neutrino spins one way and it doesn't spin backwards. This qualitative property of nature was missing in the early 80s, as a result of which string theory as an approach to unified theory, was largely neglected until 1984 when this problem was solved by some of my colleagues and the models became much more realistic. Now, since that problem was overcome, string theory has attracted widespread interest here in Israel and around the world. And I suppose that there are three main reasons for that. Well, the first reason is that it's there. It makes sense as a generalization of the standard and very tight framework of 20th century physics where everything, roughly speaking, everything is described by quantum mechanics and special relativity. Everything except gravity, which doesn't quite fit, is described in this framework of quantum mechanics and special relativity. A very tight framework. If you choose to study theoretical physics, a lot of your energy might go into understanding that framework. And it's the tightness of that framework which is one of the main reasons that theoretical physics became so powerful and that ultimately the elementary particle forces could be understood. The framework of relativity and quantum mechanics is tight enough that if you do something wrong, you get immediately punished with nonsense. Nonsense coming out of your equations. And you have to follow a very narrow framework to get anything that makes sense. And that was a very powerful tool that enabled physicists to discover the modern theories of the strong, weak, and electromagnetic interactions based on experimental clues that would not appear to be adequate for the job. So it's a very tight framework. It's hard to change anything about it without getting nonsense. Yet we do need to change it in order to incorporate gravity and to unify the forces. String theory is the only way of modifying this framework that's been discovered that makes any sense. And on that reason alone, physicists have been duty bound to take it seriously. Upon taking it seriously, it turned out that what you get when you make this modification of the standard framework is very interesting. The standard framework actually prevents you from understanding Einstein's gravity theory quantum mechanically, while the generalization of the usual framework in string theory not only enables you to solve that problem, but forces you to solve it. And in the process, you get semi-realistic models of particle physics with all of the correct forces unified with general relativity. The statement semi-realistic means that what can come out right with simple assumptions are the qualitative features of the real world, what are called the gauge forces and the strengths of the couplings, and the quantum numbers of the fermions, but not the quantitative details, such as the masses and mixing angles of the particles. The, this investigation that led to these first two statements led to a third observation which we don't really yet know if it's a success or not. The same framework led to the concept of supersymmetry, a new structure that elementary particles may have. We haven't discovered it yet at accelerators, but we have confirmed a supersymmetric prediction about elementary particle interaction rates, whose success suggests that supersymmetry might be there, and if so, that we might discover it at the next accelerator, the LHC, which is being built in Geneva. The third reason to, that string theory has attracted so much interest, and the third reason for suspecting that it may be on the right track, is that it's proved to be astonishingly, astonishingly rich, more so than even the enthusiasts, much less the critics, generally tend to realize. 
And string theory has proved to have an amazing ability to absorb competing ideas when there were competing ideas that have been interesting, such as non-commutative geometry, twister theory, black hole entropy, holography of quantum gravity, and so on. But there's something very basic we don't know about it, which is what it really is. In contrast to general relativity, where Einstein had the conception before he worked out the equations, string theory was discovered by a process, originally in accidents, trying to solve a different problem, and subsequently a long process of tinkering that I haven't had time to try to describe for you today. And after nearly four decades, we still don't really know what it is. We don't know where all those ideas really come from or are going to. So every little bit that it's unearthed comes as a surprise. That's actually one of the reasons I suspect it's on the right track. It seems that physicists have stumbled upon an amazing trail which is far beyond the conception of any one person and seems to have an incredible number of rich secrets hidden. Hopefully one of these days we'll understand it, but as I've told you, for now every bit that's unearthed comes as a surprise. If we can understand it, and if it's on the right track, can we learn how it works in nature? Well, that's another question that isn't entirely clear. The answer probably depends on such things as the nature of the answer, how clever we'll be in working with it, and what kind of clues we can get from the experiments, such as the search for supersymmetry. Thank you.